Welcome to, this is the second block of, we're in the second week of Spanish 487, which is entitled, Can You Speak Andalusian? Um, this is a class we normally teach, we normally uh, uh, do in Spanish. We're working in English today. Um, we're, we're delighted to be able to work in English today. Um, I would just want to speak very briefly up to introduce uh, Kelly and to sort of uh, offer a segue into sort of um, what we've been doing so far in the course and sort of where we're going to be going today. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I think so. We, the reason why we ended our first block a little bit later is because we got into a, a sort of a question about why. So we've been talking about Andalusian history and and sort of sort of the inferior place it has had, sort of socially, culturally, linguistically, um, for much of, of 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 its of its time. And so, I, and the question that um, some students were asking is, so why why do we care about that? Why is it important to kind of mention this? And so, I think the reason why the reason why it relates to sort of what Kelly will be talking about today is that. This leads to sort of certain, so sort of this history that we've been talking about with Andalusia, um, was sort of being this inferior variety, um, inferior region within Spain. Um, that that has consequences for for how people and speakers develop um, the identity of what are socially stigmatized varieties and what are socially prized varieties, right? And that could lead to you know linguistic profiling, linguistic dis discrimination, and especially dialect discrimination, right? And so. A lot of what happens when we talk about dialect discrimination or linguistic profiling uh, implies that when we pass judgments about certain dialects or certain linguistic features, we're often not just passing uh, judgments about the features per se, but about the people or the identities associated with those features. And that's sort of the key, the key link between what, what we're doing with Andalusian Spanish and what Kelly's talking about today, right? So um, I think that's sort of the, the connection uh, is, that, is that a little bit clearer for you, Tommy, now that sort of the connection between why we studied the history, right? So it's not just that, so the point of the course, this is this is a linguistics course, right? So the point of the, point of the, of the course is to talk about stigma associated with Andalusian Spanish. One thing is to pass judgment on linguistic features that Andalusians use. Another thing which typically is happening is what is called dialect discrimination or linguistic profiling, which is we're passing judgment on the people or the identities associated with the features that Andalusians use. And so to give an example of how that plays out with American English, we'll be talking to Kelly right today. Um, Kelly is a PhD student at the University of Michigan. Um, she, Kelly, are you on your, did you finish your third, second, fourth year this past year? My third year, yeah. Okay. Um, and so one of the things, one of the reasons why I invited Kelly, apart from the fact that she's doing amazing linguistic research, is that it's, it's amazing to see, so, you know, I finished my PhD in 2010, so 10 years ago, right? Um, and so Kelly will be finishing up, I'm assuming, in the next couple of years. And what, I, what I've loved to see about Kelly's work is a lot of the questions that she's asking, which are really obvious questions, you know, 10 years ago, linguists just weren't asking them, right? So the work that she's doing um, now are, are things that uh, are really uh, cutting edge and groundbreaking and are necessary and, and have been necessary for a long time. And linguist, linguists might have been asking them in the past, but the push that I think that Kelly uh, is, is making with her research, it's really important. There's a social importance to what she's doing, uh, apart from the linguistic. Uh, I mean, we study language, obviously, right? And so I think what I'm trying to say is, you know, 10 years ago, when I, when I thought of my dissertation, my advisors were asking me, you know, what are the linguistic theoretical implications of your work? Why do we care about what you're doing from the point of view of how phonology and how a language's phonology is structured? And, that's great, but there are also bigger questions that can be asked, right? From the, from the point of view of, of how language is used, not in a vacuum, in society, right? And, and so it's fascinating to see how much the field has advanced in, in just 10 years, really. The questions that Kelly is asking now, I think I probably wouldn't have been able to ask them 10 years ago, or maybe my advisors might not have thought they were really interesting or, or might not have been worthwhile. Um, not from a social perspective, but just in terms of what linguistics was. Um, so she's sort of at the forefront of the field and that's, it's really nice. And that's why I'm inviting her here today. Um, maybe what we can just do before Kelly introduces herself is just everybody can just kind of say first name, last name, um, what your major is just to kind of, I guess, for Kelly to know who we are. So I'll just go through my list of, of people who are on my camera. So Amber, Amber, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, I'm Amber Galvano. I study Spanish cognitive science and voice performance. Okay, Jessica, you're up next. Okay, I'm Jessica Chapla and I study MCDB in Spanish. Great, Zoe. Zoe, you're on mute, sorry. 
I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I'm Zoe Phillips and I study Spanish and communication. Okay, video. Um, I'm Vidya from Kumar. I'm studying BCN in Spanish. Sara Hansa, you're next. Hi, I'm Sarah Hansa, and I'm studying biomolecular science and Spanish. Izzy, you're up next. Hi, I'm Izzy Powers. I'm studying biomolecular science in Spanish. Okay, and Elena. Hi, I'm Elena Simons, and I'm studying business and Spanish. Tommy. Hi, I'm Tommy. I'm studying Spanish, org studies, and complet. Okay, step on. Hi, I'm Stepan Tapuzian, and I'm studying business and Spanish. Ellie. <coughs> Ellie, you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry. Hi, I'm Ellie Malley, and I'm studying psychology and Spanish. Great. Natalie. Hi, I'm Natalie Dackey, and I am studying biomolecular science and Spanish. And Kendall. Hi, I'm Kendall Cohn, and I'm studying business and Spanish. Great. Okay. Kelly. We'll leave the floor to you now. Oh my gosh, it's so great to actually get to meet you and see like moving student faces. I have missed that very much. Um, uh, thank you for hosting me. I'm really happy to be here um, and to talk to you about all of this. So I'm just, I'm just gonna get started. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Oh. Kelly, let me, I think I have to make you host. Um, can you try now? Okay. Okay. You can see this, right? Yeah. And so if we have questions, is it okay if we just sort of shout them out or what, what do you prefer, Kelly? Um, yeah. So I've got, um, I've got a spot in the middle for questions and a spot at okay. the end. Um, if you just want to hold on to them, um, I've got great. numbers on the slide. So um, if that's, if that's okay. Perfect. Um, okay, great. Um, so yeah. So thanks for having me um, here today to talk about linguistic discrimination. I, um, I know that this class is about Spanish and we're gonna talk about a lot of US examples, but I'm really excited to give you some context um, from a place that you've sort of lived and worked in. Um, you can apply to this other um, aspect of your study. Um, so I'm gonna start out by giving you some terminology and then um, a, a lot of background and examples from the US context about how linguistic discrimination has played into the ways that our laws are arranged and our social institutions. And then we'll take a break and I'll, I'll take your questions, um, clarification questions, and then I'll talk about some of my experimental results. Um, okay, great. So accent, uh, what is an accent, right? So defined by linguists, it is um, this different, a different way of speaking, right? Everyone has an accent. Um, and so it can be your, your personal speech style um, or voice, or it can be a, a way of speaking that has like a constellation of features that's related to a certain region um, or a certain social category. So in sociolinguistics, we look at these big five um, social aspects that influence the way that someone sounds and how people hear you their age, race, gender, region, and socioeconomics. Um, age and gender are interesting. We don't usually think of those as being associated with accent, um, but I guarantee you, like if you think about the way an old person sounds, just put an old person's voice in your head for a moment. Think about any cartoon you've seen with an old person. There is like an old accent, right? Um, okay, so your awareness of these accents and the importance that they play for you. So when you hear one, does it mean something? Um, that's kind of, that's individually determined, right? It's determined by your location in space time, which sounds a little out there, right? But um, the late Sam Epstein um, from the University of Michigan used to talk about this all the time because um, language is a science of physics, right? We, we talk about sound and the way it moves. And because of that, uh, space-time is one of the few constants uh, in, in our inquiry, right? So you, you come into the world at a given time and you're using language as you move through space and, th and that matters. Um, we also talk about, as linguists um, and in the popular discourse, 
the difference between a standard and non-standard accent. Um, so the difference between the two has nothing to do with their structure, right, or their users. It's determined by the wider social beliefs and practices around that variety. Um, so it is determined by social beliefs, but it's also flexible by individual positionality. So we'll talk about that. So if you grow up in an area where there's only one variety, that's your standard variety. If you move into another area and there's a different standard variety, you all of a sudden become a non-standard speaker, right? So it's, it's interestingly flexible throughout the lifetime. So a standard variety is a variety that is learned in school. It's most similar to the written form if the language has written form and it's understood by many people. So it's the language or the variety that you would use if you walked into any store or you called someone on the phone or you got a letter in the mail. It's going to be in this variety. Um, it's also usually not associated with a particular region and it's socially prized. We're going to talk a lot about this aspect of this, um, but one way that we know that it's socially prized is because it's used in government contexts in other official contexts. So it's the language that you're going to use when you go to the doctor um, or if you had to go to court, right? Um, the standard variety is special though in that it is used to intentionally or unintentionally disadvantage those who don't speak it well or at all. So there are some people who don't have access to it and that becomes a problem. Um, so non-standard varieties then are the varieties that aren't learned in school. Um, they're most similar to spoken forms and they're understood by certain groups of people. So in this list, we have African-American languages, the Southern dialect, Chicano, right? These are three varieties that are associated with a particular group of people. Um, they're also often associated with a region. So we see Indian accented English and Chinese accented English. Those are Englishes that are associated with immigrant communities in this country that come from a particular region of the world. And non-standard varieties are socially stigmatized. Um, if the bullets above were not enough to, to show that to you, um, we can look again at the government and see that they're rarely used in official context. So they're not supported institutionally. So when we talk about building a nation and when we look at how linguistic discrimination has been part of US history, um, I find these two quotes really helpful. Um, one of them is, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. That, um, that quote is often used to discuss that there's really no structural difference between a dialect and a language. It's really the social acceptance and the strength that a variety has that makes it a language um, in the way that people understand it, right? Um, and also a nation is the totality of people who speak the same language. This comes from Grimm, the same, like the same Grimm of the Brothers Grimm. He was actually a linguist, um, interesting history there. But yeah, so, so these two ideas that, that a language is supported institutionally and a nation is a group of people who speak the same language. So when we begin to look at American history, we find that passing for American throughout our history and even today meant speaking without an accent. Um, so U.S. citizenship. In our constitution, race is the key distinction between citizens and non-citizens. In 1790, the Naturalization Act defines citizens as fair complexioned people of European descent. Um, that language is still in our constitution. This Naturalization Act has been amended afterwards to include more groups. So under the law, when people came before the Supreme Court and said, I think I'm a fair complexioned person of European descent, I feel like I should be a citizen. Um, the Supreme Court had these, um, these ways of appearing and behaving that they sort of applied to the people in front of them to decide if they they could be citizens right they use these these standards so i want to walk through a couple cases um so the first one is from i up he's a man from china who applied for citizenship he's claiming whiteness he's like look at my skin i'm white um i can i'm fair complexioned i can be a citizen um and the arguments in front of the court um the people who are arguing against him in front of the supreme court said that white person doesn't refer to color of skin but instead an understanding in popular speech acquired in the literature or in common parlance so they conclude that whiteness is about language right it's the distinguishing civilizing factor of these fair complexioned peoples of european descent 
Um, and the judges then uh, look up the definition of whiteness in the dictionary and find that Mongolian isn't there and they say, Mr. Yup, you cannot be a citizen. Um, I included links to these cases because um, I'm, I'm gonna share three with you and it's only about 13 pages of reading. It's actually really interesting to see how our Supreme Court um, decided on these cases and the arguments that they actually use are, are worth reading at least once in your life. Um, okay, so ex parte Shahid is a Syrian man who applies for citizenship. Um, a Syrian man in 1909 was granted citizenship and so Shahid feels like he should also be a citizen. Um, but they conclude that Mr. Shahid is browner than a walnut and hardly speaks English. They say that his language is so poor that he could be of no benefit to the United States. So Mr. Shahid can't be a citizen. Um, U.S. versus Sindh uh, is a similar, um, an upstanding Hindu businessman applies for citizenship. Um, Najor, the, the first Syrian man who was allowed to become a citizen was a businessman. That's part of the reason why he won his case. So we have a Hindu businessman. Um, and there's this other recent minority opinion uh, that one of the justices had said he thought Indic peoples could be whites because of this idea of Caucasian. So they share a region of origin with other white people, right? But the court finds in this thinned case that these, quote, lesser peoples of Europe, right, Germans, Irish, and Poles can count as white. Those are, these are the Caucasians that are actually white. And the reason why they are white is because they quickly merge and lose the distinct hallmarks of their heritage, whereas Hindus retain the marks of ethnicity indefinitely, particularly in accent, right? So Mr. Thind can't pass as white because he can't use standard English. So he doesn't get to be a citizen. Um, this is like a six minute video of his story. He was an incredible person. Um, it, he fought in World War I. Uh, it, it's worth watching anyway. Okay. So naturalization, these cases and amendments have this 230 year history of group based amendments since 1790 that have been added into the constitution of who is allowed to be a citizen right? Fair complexion peoples of European descent plus people from Africa plus Mexicans plus blah blah blah. Like this is their, these were their words, not mine, right? Okay. Um, so as people who sound less standard and are less white are brought in, the more these groups of people are encouraged to assimilate to standard English. And this is this melting pot um, metaphor, right? Like, so America, a melting pot, we think of it as a great thing. It's like, no, we're just like an undistinguishable bowl of hot cheese. Everything looks the same. Um, so this, this is the goal, right? Okay. So fast forward a hundred years. <laughs> um, we, we sort of end up in this space where assimilation is encouraged and it's encouraged because we want people to be able to interface with, inst with our institutions using one variety of language. And because of that, and that, that, does, that doesn't make sense, right? Everyone has an accent, everyone has their own variety. It's, ne it's never gonna happen. Um, and so we end up with these deficit models um, where we see that deviations from the typical, people who don't speak standard English, um, are seen as something needing to be fixed. And that it's not only that, it's that it's the fault of the individual um, for not having access to this variety. So two instances where deficit models have played an important role are in Native American and deaf boarding schools, um, whose top-down um, approach to education was assimilationist policies that were enacted with force and isolation. So I want to talk about those for just a moment. Um, the most famous Indian boarding school was the Carlisle School. Carlisle is quoted as saying, kill the Indian and save the man. How do we kill the Indian and save the man? Well, we take away his cultural traditions. If you look at the top left, we, we take away his dress. We keep him inside so his skin becomes lighter. We cut his hair. We put him in a suit, right? Um, we teach him standard English. We do not allow him to speak his own language. Uh, we in introduce American cultural traditions, right? So we see these uh, women dressed to play basketball. Basketball was not something that happened in Native American culture. Um, these men and women were taken from their homes Homes. They were made to um, house with people who did not speak the same language. Uh, they were punished for speaking their own language with things like pouring bleach down their throat, right? So it's not just soap <laughs> in the mouth, right? It's bleach in the mouth too. Um, and 
so over this period from 1880 to 1902, we see 30,000 Native American children, my, my great grandmother among them, um, placed into boarding schools. Um, the last Native American boarding school was closed in 1978 in the United States. Um, and, and these people were taught to be domestic workers. So they were essentially uh, became wage slaves after all of this torture, essentially. Um, so we also see the boarding school model adapted for uh, deaf people in the United States. We think about it on its face, it makes sense to have a deaf school, right? We still have very excellent deaf schools in this country um, that are operating today because the medium of instruction in most of our schools is spoken language, right? Spoken English and people who can't hear can't access information that way. And so it makes sense to have another school that uses a different medium. However, um, we at the same time, at, at the time that uh, boarding schools are starting to arise for deaf people, we also have the school of oralism that arises. So this man um, in the bottom right corner here is Alexander Graham Bell, <laughs> the inventor of the telephone, um, held up as a hero of American culture, um, who is also the father of oralism. And his idea was that it is only the hearing organs of the deaf child that are, um, are non-functional, right? They're, they're speaking organs, their articulators are perfectly intact. And because of that, they can be made to vocalize spoken English, right? No problem, right? Any linguist, any linguist will tell you that this is not how language works. Um, but oralists' uh, practices are still very healthy in the United States today. These schools absolutely still exist. Um, lots of physicians tell you that this is the way to go with a deaf child. Um, but anyway, so in these schools, children are made to sit in front of mirrors um, and practice their articulations. In the picture with Alexander Graham Bell, he's got the child's hand against his larynx so he can uh, feel like vibration, vocalization, um, or they're, they've got their hands against drums. In the most extreme cases, children have their hands bound um, for the entire school day so they cannot sign with each other. Um, sometimes in these early days, it was for an entire semester of school that they would have their hands bound. Um, yeah, it's a problem. Anyway, so these are deficit models, right? Something needing to be fixed and something for um, that is at the fault of the, the speaker, the learner. Okay. okay, so all of these sort of policies are about assimilation and they're about assimilation to standard spoken English. Right. Um, so those were extreme examples, but we do see this um, in education. We also see it in the workplace. Right. English is the language of global capital. And so not only in the United States, but across the world, um, students learn spoken English at the expense of their own varieties, um, own local varieties in, in school for the workplace. It's also um, associated with social advancement, right? So to be like a college professor or a CEO or the president, right? You're supposed to be able to have standard spoken English. Um, to be attractive to a spouse or something like that, you're supposed to have standard spoken English. And so assimilation, it's part of everything. Um, and so we find then that accent becomes the first point of gatekeeping, right? So if you don't sound standard, then we can make assumptions about your character. We can make assumptions about how you're going to be in a given situation. So there are some consequences for not assimilating, right? Because we've built our structures to assume that you're gonna speak the standard variety. So when you speak a non-standard variety, what happens? So Hispanic English learners um, in this country, and so we're talking about citizens and non-citizens in this country, are more likely to work in high risk professions because of their limited English proficiency. Um, Davila et al. does a large scale statistical study, um, a meta analysis showing that um, deaths and injuries among this population rose 86% um, from 1992 to 2006. They are the population that is at the most risk. Um, they do work with like toxic chemicals and um, among like high heat and out in <laughs> like environments where they can be injured. Um, and so you, you maybe wouldn't think that Hispanic English learners as a group is like the group that's most likely to die on the job, but in fact it is. Um, and in a paper I wrote with some other colleagues here at the University of Michigan, we talk about this study and a, a number of others if you're more interested in that. Assimilation is also something that people do for personal safety. Right? So it's not just 
for education and for work and for social advancement, it's also so that I don't get hurt, right? Um, and so I wanna give you some examples that make that painfully clear. Um, so some consequences of not assimilating, right? Of not using the standard variety. Two women were detained at the Montana border for speaking Spanish uh, in 2015 or 2016. These two women, um, Ana Suda and Mimi Hernandez, there's a video here if you wanna look at that, um, were detained at the Montana border in a truck stop um, for speaking Spanish. The state trooper who detained them, um, they got a video of it. He says, it has to do with you guys speaking Spanish in the store in a state that's predominantly English speaking, okay? All right, so using a variety that's not the standard variety threatens your freedom. Um, and speaking a different language at a border actually has a really important uh, historical significance, right? So this term shibboleth, which you've probably seen anytime you've tried to log into something using your UMID, right? It comes up in the address bar, shibboleth, um, comes from the Bible, right? So in the book of Judges, we're told this story about 40,000 ephemerites who are killed at the River Jordan, which is a border, um, and they're killed because they're identified by their inability to pronounce shibboleth. They say it like sibboleth, right? Um, and so they know that they're not a member of Gilead, right? Because they don't say it the right way. So this is a story from the Bible, but we see something very similar happening in like our, our history, right? Um, this massacre that's called the Parsley Massacre is uh, a, conf uh, a part of a larger conflict that actually split the island of Hispaniola into two countries, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Um, and they remain split today um, because of these conflicts. So um, the president of the Dominican Republic orders any Haitian entering the country by crossing this river to be killed. And Haitians are identified by their darker shade of skin, which is not that much darker, right? So that's secondary, but primarily it's their ability to pronounce the Spanish word parsley. Um, my Spanish and French are not great, but it's perajil in Spanish versus perajil in French. So a uvular trill ch versus an alveolar trill r, right? So if they're using the uvular which from the French contact variety, they know that they're Haitian um, and they get killed. 30,000 Haitians were killed in six days along this river in October in 1937, right? So speaking with an accent, um, not assimilating to a standard variety, uh, it threatens your personal safety, right? So if you know that you could be judged or killed, uh, for sounding a certain way, a natural reaction is changing the way you sound for a better outcome, right? Is giving, um, giving way to assimilation. And so we find that um, there's a lot, of, a lot of information on how you, uh, U.S. immigrant families speak only English by the third generation. So there's some, some sources if you're interested in that. Um, so we're going to take a break in just a moment, but I just want to say that like my research asks, like, does this even work? right? Does assimilating protect you? Um, does it help you advance, right? And so what kinds of com contemporary consequences do we see when people aren't assimilating to the standard variety? So I'm going to give a short summary um, and then open up for your clarification questions. So yeah, accents are about sounding standard or not. Sounding American means sounding standard and what's at stake is being entitled to the full rights of citizenship, like being able to walk into a gas station um, and institutions are built around rewarding people who sound standard okay so i'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and take your questions if you have them let's go somebody questions i'm sure can there you, are questions can you repeat oh. the um the last or one of the last slides about like what your specific research asks the questions that you were asking? Yeah, so my research, um, it asks like what, um, does assimilating even help you, right? Oh, do we okay. see that if people are using the standard variety in a given instance, does it help? Do they, are they treated better? Okay. Um, and if you use a non-standard variety, what consequences do we see? Okay. Yeah. Um, when you say like third generation immigrants um, speak English, does that mean like the kids lose their ability to speak the foreign language as well, like bilingualism is no yeah. longer? Yeah, great question. So what we see is 
So you have a family who immigrates to the United States, right? They speak a language that their first language is not English. Um, they have children. They encourage the children to learn to speak English. So that second generation might be bilingual, um, very likely is bilingual, um, but uses English primarily. It becomes essentially their dominant language. And then when that generation has children, they don't have enough um, fluency in their heritage language to teach their children to use it in their own home. And so the third generation children only learn English. Um, and so you find in, um, increasingly smaller communities of heritage language speakers in the United States over time. Thank you. Yeah. Is I was it? Oh, no, you can go. No, you go first. You go first. Okay. Um, <laughs> is this whole idea of kind of like what you study, the assimilation and, you know, does it work? Is it like, how does it affect people in their lives? Is it as prevalent, like globally everywhere? Are there any places where, I mean, obviously you mentioned some examples throughout history of, you know, different things, but is there anywhere in the world where it's not as present not or not as severe? That's a great question. Um, there are certainly some places that do better than others, right? Um, but we see a lot of these same structures replicated in lots of places. I mean, the former Yugoslavia, right? Um, the, all of these places in Eastern, in Southern and Eastern Europe, um, where everyone speaks a different language, but those languages were only made different when a border was drawn overnight, right? So all of a sudden you were all speaking Yugoslavian and now all of a sudden you speak Bosnian and the people next door speak Croatian and you're a different country, right? So lots of um, institutional support gets put behind those new varieties, right? So these things sort of happen. We also see like in places like, like Germany and Poland and other places where they have like four or five official languages. So it's not just that like when you go to the doctor, you're only speaking standard English. It's like you're speaking one of five languages, right? Um, but none of those languages are actually like home varieties, right? They're, they're not like any of these contact or heritage varieties that have these rich histories, right? They're not represented institutionally. Do people who speak those varieties get arrested for speaking them? <laughs> um, not as often, right? But it, but it does happen. When you look at places like Africa, right? Africa, uh, Ghana, where I did, I did my undergraduate thesis um, research there, they have 140 languages in the space of uh, Montana, right? And the size of Montana is 140 languages that are represented. Um, only four of them are taught in school. So there's a really good chance that you've never even seen the language that your parents speak and the language that you speak at home written. Um, even if there is a written form, you've never seen like a textbook or a TV show or a t-shirt or anything like that, a road sign, nothing, right? It's not part of the linguistic landscape. Um, and so that's, that is a stigma in a way, right? It's, it's maybe not as in, encoded in the laws in every country in the same way as it is here, but any place where you have two forms of a language in competition, which is every country in the world, um, there is some sort of tension there and some historical tension that may, maybe isn't as pronounced today as it was at different periods in time. I was wondering, uh, Kelly, so this, this was a great introduction. Um, a lot of the students who are taking this course may or may not have, a, have had a previous linguistics course in our department. Some of them have may, might have taken Spanish 298, which is like the intro to linguistics course, where we talk about Noam Chomsky, right, and the ideal listen, uh, uh, speaker or listener. And so I'm wondering if you could just, I know this is maybe this is an obvious question for you, but I think it's important to kind of just get it out there. What is the relationship between sort of Chomsky and linguistics and the linguistics that you're doing in a yeah. nutshell? Absolutely. I think they're super related. Um, <laughs> some people would be really upset about that. But okay. um, so Chomsky looks at language in the way that Newton looks at physics, right? And this idea that you explain everything that happens and everything that doesn't happen to get down to an underlying structure. So when we are building like trees, you know, of language and saying like, here's the verb, like John kicked the cloud, John kicked the ball, right? Oh. Like, we're, we're organizing that structure to understand how the mind puts the other ideas, right? So I have an action, I wanna describe it, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So the kind of work that, and like the structures that don't exist are just as interesting, right? So John did this, but he didn't do all these other things. And that helps us explain what the underlying structure is that's functioning. 
um, my work is really about how that kind of interaction works between people. Um, so not just internally in the one like listener perceiver, um, right? But in people in conversation, so speakers and listeners. Um, what I'm really interested in is how we tap into these larger knowledges that we have about varieties. So the results that I'm about to talk to you about um, show how people hear a voice, something very quick, right? And they can say, oh, this person is over five and under 55. I think they're a woman. I think they might be from Tennessee, right? Like that information is accessible because we have structured our knowledge of uh, features of varieties, right? We, we know when we hear a voice that we've heard before. We know when, um, you know, we hear a voice we like or we don't like, or somebody sounds like sketchy, right? Like we have this whole bank of sketchy voices in our heads, right? Um, that operates on the same fundamental structures that Chomsky is talking about when he's talking about syntax and how you know what a verb is and where you know how to put an ED and, you know, that kind of stuff, so. Great. So I guess the idea is the structure uh, is more dynamic and more complex than Chomsky might have assumed. Is that what you're trying to, is that, is that the idea? I don't know if it's that. I think that Chomsky is, it, he really just had to confine his, his vein of inquiry, right? So it's the idea of like, I am cutting off my, what I'm interested in at the, the individual. I want to know what everyone is carrying around that makes it work. Um, my questions are more about how does it work? <laughs> where, where, where do we see it working and what happens? And his is like, what's the system? I actually have a quick question as well. Um, are there any like major differences or like what's the major difference between an accent and a dialect? That's a great question. Um, so sometimes people have an accent and it's not really attached to any particular like region or um, something like that. Uh, most of the time when we talk about dialects, we think about them like geographically. So, you know, in the UK, right? Like the prestige variety is Southern. It's, you know, attached to like London, whereas you have like Welsh and Scottish and everything. Like those are regions and groups of people that have a particular way of speaking. Um, but accent is really just a, a, like a sort of noticeable way of speaking, a different way of speaking. So you could have like foreign accent in English that could cover people from many regions, right? Um, there's a lot of studies on the difference between I hear an accent, but I know this person's American versus I hear an accent. And I know this person isn't American. So we're carrying a lot of different information that's either specified or non-specified between like accents and dialects. I would say that, um, dialects are really just broader, like more like understood in like a larger um, like a superordinate category, right? Like, so it's like everyone from the South has a Southern dialect, right? And it doesn't recognize like the variation in between, like with somebody who sounds Texas instead of Georgia, right? Like a Georgia accent and a Texas accent are both captured under the Southern dialect, right? Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question too, and I think maybe this is something you'll go into when you talk about your research, but aside from like whether moving to standard helps people like through legal action or kind of like logically, have you also kind of looked into like the psychological effects of like what speaking standard does to someone, whether like positive or negative? That is an excellent question. Um, really glad you asked that. I am, and that's actually part of my dissertation um is looking at sort of how people feel about switching between their varieties and sort of when they do it and why and what pressures they feel to use them um my master's thesis looks at this a little bit as well in that um, and there's a lot of research on it about stereotype threat um or linguistic insecurity they kind of mean the same they mean the same thing but they come out of different literatures so phil Lebov, um, writes about linguistic insecurity, saying that people know that there is stigma with their variety, and they and so they and they don't want people to judge them, and so they use the standard variety in lots of different situations because they feel bad about it. Um, people become they become believers in these negative ideologies, right? So, 
um, I'm, I'm mixed race, um, which you guys will find out in a moment. Um, the, the black half of my family told me not to sound black when I was little, right? That it would get me in trouble, that I wouldn't be safe, that I, people wouldn't think that I was smart, right? Um, and so now I have, I, I don't use that variety in lots of different scenarios, right? Um, because I've kind of been taught not to. Um, and so that definitely has a lot of psychological effects, especially um, among, uh, even among groups of the users of the language itself, right? They judge each other for using the variety in certain circumstances. Yeah. Is there, are people always um, aware when they're switching between different accents? Great question. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, yeah, people switch. I mean, so most people don't feel, a, a lot of people don't feel like they have an accent at all. Right. right. Um, and so it's, and it's, it's difficult, um, you know, out in the world, right. Versus linguists drawing lines between things, right. Like, so people in the world use different voices all the time, right. Like you use a different voice when you talk to your mother versus when you talk to your friends, right. Et cetera, et cetera. Right. Like that kind of shifting is things that we're perhaps not aware of all the time. And it is the exact same operation that's happening when you're moving in between codes, right? Or different, different languages, different full languages, different dialects, different styles, different accents, right? So we do this unconsciously all the time. Maybe we should move on, Kelly. Okay. So at 617, we have until about 657-ish. Is okay. that okay for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The cool part's coming up still. We have to get through all the results, which are always the funnest part. Okay. Okay. Super, thank you. I'm going to jump right back in. Oh, okay. So my research is asking, like, does assimilation even work? And what kinds of contemporary consequences do we see? So I'm looking at housing and I'm looking at housing in particular because um, of the Fair Housing Act, which protects home buyers from discrimination um, in these protected classes that have been edited over time. Um, but it also states that discrimination is something that must occur in physical proximity, right? I have to stand in front of you for you to know that I'm a woman, right? Um, just hearing my voice isn't enough for that. And so in this kind of situation, uh, linguistic discrimination becomes com particularly insidious, right? Because it happens in a moment. So the huh of my hello, right? Hello, <laughs> right? Is enough for you to know that I'm a woman. It's enough for you to make a guess about my age, right? These two groups that are protected from discrimination. Um, it's also enough for you to know about my race. Um, and this happens outside the space of canonical legal discrimination, which means that people aren't protected um, when it's only my voice that's interacting with you. And so this landmark study on dialect discrimination, Cornell, and Sardi and Baugh from 1999, um, looks at the Fair Housing Act and they see that, um, they see that in fact race is reflected in the voice, right? That we can hear race and in addition, um, that listeners do positively identify a speaker's dialect with great accuracy. So it's not just that I hear it, it's that I'm right about it. Um, and that social discrimination and auditory identification are possible. So the Fair Housing Act needs to be uh, edited. And so these studies and Baugh's future work come, become um, or come to call this phenomenon linguistic profiling. And so what linguistic profiling is, it operates similar to racial profiling. So it's like the whole driving while black thing. It's like, you see a black guy in a car, you pull him over because he's a criminal, right? Like, so linguistic profiling works in the same way. It's this informal, on the spot, largely non-conscious speech judgments, which are then linked to social stereotypes. So I hear a person and they sound black. They're speaking African-American English. That leads me to believe all of these different things about them. I hear a person, they sound female, right? That leads me to believe all these different things about them. And then I respond to them differently because I know I'm talking to a woman versus a man, whatever, right? Linguistic profiling. Um, so what I'm doing or what I did, did, was an audit, an audit study of the housing market um, using uh, a method very similar to the Purnell et al study. Um, housing discrimination is been rampant in the US context. Um, if you want to ask more questions about that later, please do. Um, but 
discrimination based on race in particular is part of our housing history. So that's one reason why this is interesting, right? So I have a list of questions that I ask everyone I talk to, and I have this um, target population, these uh, places that I'm going to call, and uh, each participant hears only one voice. So they're not getting three calls, which is how the Purnell et al. study is arranged. Um, I just called more people and looked at each voice um, in comparison. So I'm going to play these for you. Um, I'm studying three native dialects, my three native dialects, which are African American language, Southern American, and standard. Um, Hello, I am interested in the experience of poverty in the United States and its impact. Just a second. Hi, I was calling today to find out about what apartments you might have available. Phone. Is it possible to increase the volume a little bit? We're, we're, those are kind of low, low for us. Oh, let me see. Oh, it looked like that was up all the way. Um, well, I can just maybe give you some examples myself. How's that? Would that be better? Yeah. Okay. So it's so hard for me to move in between one and the other. Um, so Southern, hi, I'm calling today to find out about what apartments y'all might have available. African American, hello, I'm calling today to find out about what apartments y'all might have available. Standard, hello, I'm calling to learn more about your property, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, so those are examples of the three um, voices that were tested in this study that I used in the calls and then, then I subsequently tested to see how people felt about them. Um, so I've got three target neighborhoods that are separated by racial and socioeconomic demographics, a white working class neighborhood, a middle class neighborhood, and a black working class neighborhood. I did the study in my hometown, um, which mirrors uh, part of what Purnell et al. did. They were people, they lived in the town that they called, so they had a better idea of the information that people were giving them in the calls. Um, so these blue flags are the white, um, the middle class area, the red is the white working class area, and the green is the black neighborhood. Um, the area in pink is the University of Tennessee. It also includes like the poorest areas of town. Um, on the other side of the river, it's highly industrial, lots of white people. Um, there were no properties available in this space um, throughout the entire time I was calling. So the lowest, um, you know, rung of the socioeconomic ladder was not available, um, which is in information in and of itself. But anyway, just to explain the circle. Oval, anyway. Um, so my predictions relate to commitment level. And what commi the commitment level I'm talking about is when I call to get an appointment. So in the original study, which was happening when there were like answering machines, um, was people would get a yes or a no. They would call after hours and leave three messages on a voice uh, on a machine. Um, so the person heard um, three dialects, people in three dialects asking about an apartment and they looked at who got the call back. Like, which one did they call? Did they call all of them back and say no? Did they only call one of them back and say yes? Um, no's don't happen as much in this day and age, right? And so we're looking instead at commitment level. Did someone make an appointment with me that I was gonna, it was gonna be me and them at a given time, a traditional appointment? Or did they say like, oh, sure, our office hours are from nine to five? Or you can go online and take a virtual tour. Right, so that's the kind of thing I'm looking at when I'm talking about commitment level. Um, and I'm also looking for local prestige effects. So this goes all the way back to the beginning when we talked about how accent, standard and non-standard is flexible by individual positionality. So in a black neighborhood, the black voice is standard, <laughs> right? So black people speak that, that variety, many black people speak that variety. And so when I'm calling and using that variety, we would expect me to experience a higher commitment level there. Whereas using standard marks me in a different way, right? So essentially it works in multiple directions. So these predictions are about um, my commitment level and prestige for each voice. 
So the Southern voice will do the best in the white working class neighborhood. The standard voice will do the best in the middle class neighborhood, et cetera. Okay. Just to clarify, so you had yeah. conversations as opposed to leaving messages on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an answering machine? That's right. These calls were on average about 22 minutes long. I have about 560 hours of recorded conversations um, <laughs> that I had with these uh, property managers. Yeah, absolutely. And so each call, you were using one of the three voices is the idea. That's right. Okay. Could you just do them one more time for us? We're, we're, we're really, a lot of students who are in the class took the phonetics and phonology class. So they're really into like hearing differences and like even like transcribing them. So I could see that they were all getting really excited when you use the three different voices. Okay. Okay. So um, the Southern voice is something like, hi, I'm calling today to find out about what apartments y'all might have available. Um, the Muse voice is like, hello, I'm calling to learn more about your property. Um, and the black voice is like, hello, I'm calling to find out about what apartments y'all might have available. Right. Um, so those are the three, but it was like a whole conversation. Um, feel free yeah. to ask me questions about how I prepared for that and what they look like and the questions I asked and stuff like that later, if you're interested. Just to clarify one yeah. thing. So it wasn't just phonetic features that were changing also more for syntactic features. That's correct. It's, um, and part of the reason for that is, it's a great question. Um, dialects vary on more than just phonetic and ph phonetics and phonology, right? It's about lexical items. It's about speech rate, um, right? And so they, they vary completely. Um, it's not the exact same sentence. Now, when we talk about the survey um, in a couple slides, uh, those were identical sentences. So there's no uh, like lexical or morphosyntactic variation um, in those other tests. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, move on. So, so here, um, here are some results. I, um, a, and this can be maybe a little difficult to interpret. So starting on the left, we have the neighborhood, the black working class neighborhood. In the middle, we have the middle class neighborhood. And um, on the right, we have the white working class neighborhood. What we're looking at is a larger dark green bar, right? So to say that we've had a prestige effect um, means that we've, we've gotten more traditional appointments. So we look at the Southern voice in the white working class uh, group on the left, um, or on the right rather, sorry. Um, we see that that's happening, right? We've got a big dark green bar for the Southern voice. That's what we expected. Moving to the middle, there's not much different going on here. There's no statistical significance between um, all three voices in the middle class neighborhood. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And then when we move over to the black working class neighborhood on the left, we do see that there is a slight difference, um, a slight advantage for the African American voice in that black working class neighborhood, there is statistical significance there um, and that the other two are kind of on par with each other. So insert a whole bunch more math um, and feel free to ask me questions about the mathy parts if you wish. Um, we find that the statistics are consistent with the raw data and the predictive modeling, which I just showed you, and that they are consistent with my predictions. So the Southern voice is doing best in the white working class neighborhood um it's doing the black voice is doing best in the black neighborhood and the muse voice does better in the middle class community um but it's really on par in the other two so if we like skip back you can see that um in the leftmost box and the rightmost box muse is doing basically the same it's not really having any prestige effects in the white working class or black working class neighborhood and that they're even between the two groups. Um, okay, so that's really the results of the housing study, but please do ask me questions about the calls and like what I experienced there if you'd like. Um, it really is an hour long presentation on its own, so I, I would rather it be driven by your questions, what we talk about. Um, in addition to this, I did a social assessment survey. So I asked people using samples from uh, these calls, so I took um, I cut greetings out of these calls and um, had them normed and then used those greetings for this social assessment survey. And so I asked people, what race do you hear? What region do you hear? And what kind of speaker is this? Um, I'm not going to present the region results because they take a little while to talk about their, and then they're kind of messy. Um, but I do have those slides if you want to look at them. Um, 
So for race, we see that um, the standard American voice is raced as white. So people hear it, they hear a white person. Um, these are all me again, by the way. <laughs> um, but so this is what we expect. Um, the Southern voice is also indexed to whiteness, which is again, what we expect. I mean, this is like the ideology of a Southern speaker is a white speaker. Um, and the black voice is rated as black at, it's higher than chance. So that's what we expect. Um, we can talk a little bit about why this isn't as highly rated as black if you, if you have questions about that later. Um, so people are hearing race and they're doing it accurately, which, um, you know, replicates the results that Purnell et al found. Um, but in addition to Purnell et al, something that they didn't do, I have them, um, the listeners then do an attribute assessment. So I asked my participants to rate each voice on 10 attribute characteristics. I gave them a 100 point slider um, with each characteristic. So they weren't binary. Um, they just had 10 attributes in a line and they got to put the slider wherever they chose. And so here are these attributes. Um, we've got pleasantness, um, but we've got feminine, masculine, rich, and poor. And then on top of that, we've got pleasant, confident, educated, trustworthy, attractive, and difficult. Um, these adjectives came out of a national survey of rental professionals that I did when I asked people, um, you know, can, they, can you describe an ideal tenant? Um, they came up with words like this, right? Um, so standard is in the middle. So you can think about the, it being in comparison to the other two non-standard dialects on both sides. They are not color coded, however, because the, the standard in green has the most positively valenced uh, traits and the African American in red has the most negatively valenced traits and Southern is right in the middle. So we see that the African American voice is rated as the least present. And again, like they're just getting a greeting from the call, like, hi, I'm calling about this apartment. Like that's all they heard, right? It's rated as the least pleasant, least trustworthy, least attractive, least confident, most poor, most masculine, most difficult. Um, the standard voice is the most rich and the least poor and the most educated sounding. And it receives the most positively balanced ratings in other categories. However, the Southern voice, um, when we look at standard deviations, it's about on par with the uh, standard voice in terms of confidence, masculinity, femininity, difficulty, trustworthiness, and pleasantness. Um, this is the effect of whiteness in the Southern voice, but the effect of non-standardness becomes apparent when we see the distinctiveness for this voice playing out in rich and poor, educated and attractive. So with these four characteristics, there really is a three-step tier with African-American language at the bottom, Southern language in the middle, and standard language at the top. Um, so just to give you a visualization, a different visualization of this, um, this helps us look to see, um, is this from outlier effects, right? Like, do we just have a handful of people rating them in one way or the other? No, um, <laughs> but I want you to zero in on kind of two results that really relate to these deficit models and other things that we've already been talking about. So again, with standard in the middle and the two non-standard dialects on either side, we see that that green bubble is really concentrated, right? The, the mean for educated um, is around 74. So it's uh, above 50%, um, it's very concentrated. The Southern is a little more diffuse, but it is hovering over the 50% um, the mark, whereas the African-American voice is much more distributed. People kind of rated it all over. We do have ratings at zero, right? So like people thought I had never had education or very little education, right? Um, multiple advanced degrees, but it's fine. And <laughs> same thing with trustworthiness, right? Um, you see that there's really a tight cluster for the Southern voice, um, the, or for the standard voice, the Southern is a little more distributed and the African-American voice is much more distributed. Um, and trustworthiness is like the key concept that I'm kind of looking at in this, um, in my further assessments here because um, property managers said that they were listening for trustworthiness. So I asked people if I sounded trustworthy. Um, yeah, so linguistic profiling. 
there's general agreement among participants on the profiles for each voice, right? Like that's what these violin plots show us is that there aren't outliers. Most people were rating them the same. Um, and a factor analysis shows that perceiving even one negatively valenced social trait can have consequences for the entire profile. Why is this important? There were a handful of participants, as we saw, who rated that black voice as white, right? So they might not have heard enough features in my voice to say, that's a black person speaking. However, their linguistic profiles were similar to the other people who actually did rate them black, which means that they heard something in my voice that said, maybe they're a little less trustworthy. Maybe this female speaker is a little more masculine sounding, right? That one negatively valenced trait has consequences for the entire profile, right? So it's not just that I heard somebody who sounded a little, a little more masculine, not black necessarily, but a little more masculine, but also I thought that person was less trustworthy, less attractive, less educated, et cetera, et cetera. So they're highly correlated attributes. Um, so that's important. And yeah, sorry to interrupt up, right? Like this matters. Uh, we didn't talk about housing discrimination, but God, can I talk about it for days. Um, 190 years of racialized housing discrimination in this country. All of our school funding is based on where we live, right? Um, so it's really important. Um, we know that people accurately hear social information in a voice. We know that people then make judgments based on that voice alone. We also know that property managers care about how you sound and therefore discrimination based on voice should be included in our constitution somewhere, anywhere, please, dear God, in my lifetime. Um, yeah, so in summary, um, using Muse um, or assimilating doesn't really seem to help you very much in this housing context. I realize that that may not seem clear from what I've presented here, so I encourage you to ask more questions about that. Um, and that people hear your race and region and that influences how they feel about you as a person, right? And so just to leave you with one thing to think about is that like any time you have to open your mouth to accomplish a task, linguistic discrimination is at play, right? So thanks. I welcome your questions with the time we have remaining. Can we all clap at the same time? Okay, we have, we have time, yeah, 638. Um, so yeah, who wants to start some questions? Thank you so much. This is fascinating stuff. Thanks. When you, uh, um, when you say that the, you know, speaking with the muse, the, the standard um, doesn't necessarily like a factor have as much of a role in the housing, is that mainly just attributed to the region you were in? Kind of like what you started the presentation with, how like this, the, I forget the exact terminology, but what's normal in a certain place depends. That's a good question. Um, there's a chance that the standard variety is always somewhat stigmatized in Knoxville because it is the South. It's the largest city in Appalachia. Um, but a lot of people speak standard English there. Um, I grew up speaking standard English there um, and spoke the Southern variety with my relatives, my older relatives. Um, that's absolutely a possibility. That's also a question that folks asked, um, asked uh, John Baugh when he did this study in uh, Southern California originally, um, was maybe this accent just it doesn't mean as much in this space, and so we can't say. Um, there is ab there's absolutely a chance. We, we certainly, I, I can't answer that question with the results that I have, um, but I would wager that, um, Honestly, I think that it's more that sounding non-standard hurts you than sounding standard helps you, if that makes sense. So it's, it's neutral, it's default, right? Um, I had a question about the surveys. So when people were choosing like the race that they heard are, so like, I don't know how to phrase this, but like, it, are people more likely to hear like their own race than other races, if that makes sense? That's a great question. Um, maybe. There's some, there's some evidence that an own race bias is definitely something in, um, in perception. Um, the paper is Parashioni et al. <laughs> if you guys want to look at it. Um, but um, yeah, there's a, there's a chance. That's, that's probably why I got 
the, those Asian results, those, there are two participants um, out of 60 that rated me Asian. Um, there are absolutely no Asian features in any of the speech samples that they heard, right? Um, so the one way to explain that is these were Asian listeners um, or people weren't attending to the task. Um, but they had a free choice. There, there, there wasn't a forced choice, right? So they were able to write whatever they heard in the box. Um, and so that's part of the reason why we got some, some weird outliers that are hard to explain, but an own race bias is absolutely something um, that does take effect in some, in some cases. Yeah, good question. Um, kind of going off of that within the survey, why, I know you kind of said you would explain it further, why did you see with the African-American um, English that the, some people were, or like it wasn't rated as um, African-American as anticipated and like had such a white prominence? Yeah, that's a good question. So part of that is um, they sound a little more standard. And when I was actually sitting down and making these phone calls, picking up the phone and trying to like be polite, <laughs> right? And sound like, please take me seriously, right? On the phone, um, I sound a little more standard than I would when I'm just like sitting down talking to my dad, <laughs> right? And so um, it does sound, I guess, less black than the other, um, the other, the voice, the sample that you heard, right? Um, that was done, used in a pilot study, and um, the ratings for that voice were like 85%. So why do we get 62%? Part of that was I was definitely being a little more formal. Um, if I had taken a sample from the middle of the conversation, it would probably have been a little bit different. I actually did, um, I cut those samples, but I ran out of money. <laughs> So I didn't run that part of the study. Um, it's, it would be really interesting to see. Another part is that like, I am in fact mixed race. Um, and so having not actually sort of grown up and participated in using these features like everyday life, like never at one point in my life has it been something I used every day and in every context that I sort of use it in, that those features are not as pronounced in my variety as they might be in others. Um, people definitely still heard blackness and they heard it more than chance. Um, and even those people who rated it white still heard all of these negative personality features, even though they weren't putting me into that box explicitly. Um, but part of the reason why that, that choice is interesting is, be, or is there is probably because my variety has changed a little bit and is not as strong as others. And I was being a little more formal than casual. Those are my best guesses. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I can ask a question. Now, first of all, I want to say these are amazing questions. I mean, this is great for a, a class of undergraduate students. This is like such an, an engaged uh, group of students. I, I love these questions. Um, uh, the one question, so one question that kept coming back to me was the influence of, of gender. And so I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit more as, as having, you know, gender is something that is confounded in your, in your experimental design. And I'm wondering um, why, I, I assume I know why you did that, but I'm wondering if you know, when you were writing your dissertation, if any other dissertation committee members asked about whether you would, whether you would include that as, 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 a, as a factor in your design. Um, you didn't, but I'm wondering, what would your hypotheses be? Do you think you would have the same kind of distributions if this, this were somebody comparable to you, but a male voice? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, and the, the similar question from the opposite direction was asked of Ba and has been asked of Ba many times is like, you're only a male speaker. If we had had a woman in here, how would it look different? So part of me being only a woman sort of answers some of those questions that were posed in his original study is like, do we still see this um, happen with women? Um, it, it's very interesting, actually. I, I would be really curious to see how it would work if I got a, a person, a, ma a male bodied, male voiced person to um, do these calls. Um, I think that I, I talked to a lot of women. Um, there were a lot of female property managers that, who answered the phone call. Lots of men too. I mean, it was really about 50-50, but it was more women than I expected. And it was more women that were reported in the original study. So those demographics had changed. I also wrote down like who I thought I was listening to. So it's not like I asked them directly like, hey, are you a girl? It was like, <laughs> you know, here's who I think I'm hearing. Because a lot of people ask about accommodation, right? And other things of like, who do you think you're talking to influences your variety? Um, I, I think that, and, and also the, the, the final question, the final question of the protocol 
is, do I seem like a good fit? All right, so I asked them directly, do I seem like a good fit for your property? And people were not expecting that answer or that question. So I got a lot of really interesting answers, but a lot of people were like, well, you're a young woman. You're going to be, you're, you're like neat. Like I'm not neat. You're, you're neat. Like we, we expect you to be more responsible. Oh, you're a student. You're a young woman. You're just like coming into this. So there was something about a woman asking for these apartments that did kind of give me a sort of maybe more trustworthy, maybe more responsible seeming than a man at my same apparent age. Um, and so I think that that's really interesting. It absolutely, because people commented on it explicitly, given a male voice, clearly the outcome would have been different. They would have made a different assumption there, whether they stated it outright or not. Great. I had another question. Actually, it comes from, so I have a niece who's 22 years old and she, she goes to college part-time. And so I was talking to her about your, about my class this morning, because she loves talking to me, talking to me about what I do in my class. Right. And so I explained the whole, your, your whole study to her. And her question to me was, why would somebody ever call to apply for a housing? Wouldn't you just do that online versus Craigslist? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so the question is, so from her point of view, it's like, I wouldn't have even, it wouldn't even have occurred to me to call. Did you think about how written English influences? Because apparently nowadays, the people in front of us, these millennials, I don't know how they, how they talk about themselves. They don't use the phone, right? So, so how, 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 what, what do you think about that? Okay. You would not believe how incredibly hard it was to get a physical phone put in the phonetics lab. Really? It took me, it took me three months and cost me $700. So just interesting, interesting. Um, okay. It's really difficult to still find. So a lot of properties are still listed with phone numbers. Um, I did all of the searching on Craigslist. Um, my, the properties that I could call were limited by the ones that had phone numbers, right? Um, so I, there were still plenty of, um, like advertisements, but it was tough, right? To find people that would actually pick up the phone and had places that you could call. Um, Craigslist was great because it's individual phone numbers. So it's not just like a business that's going to give you the same answer, no matter what question you ask. Um, so that was good, but absolutely in the 20 years in between my study and the original study, uh, calling for an apartment, not something that most people do. There has been a study. Um, I cited it on one of my slides. It's Massey and Lundy 2011 um, that did use emails um, and used um, accent features, non-standard features in the emails to see, do we get this similar pattern? Short answer is yes, you do. Um, long answer is don't love the way that they represented dialects in print <laughs> um, in that study and like, you know, with unlimited time and resources would we do in these ways. But yeah, so we absolutely do see the same effect um, when people are answering emails. Um, I also, I have, I have yet to study them, but have gathered all of the um, email correspondence that I got from these people. I didn't um, initiate it, but if they asked for an email address, I did give them one. and. So I have lots of different stuff that they sent and there is some interesting differences of here are the kinds of things that they sent to the black speaker, like bus schedules, <laughs> which neither of the, the white voices ever got sent to bus schedules. So there is some interesting stuff going on in the textual side of this as well. I have a question. Um, I know that you said like uh, voice discrimination should be something included in the, um, or should be, uh, there should be a law against it. Um, but like beyond that, what else do you see as like necessary to happen to like continue destigmatizing these voices in the future? Yeah, um, great question. I want to see what's happening right here. I want people thinking about language, right? Um, we don't teach linguistics in primary or secondary education. It's not part of curriculum. And yet the voice language is part of everything that we do, right? And um, our entire legal system is a linguistic endeavor, right? Our laws are written down. Um, <laughs> and so it matters that we've codified sort of how we sort of exist and argue and who has rights and who doesn't in language, right? Um, and I think that uh, giving people more information about their own voices, their own bodies, their own minds and how they work makes you more interested and aware of how language is being used in other places, right? So we see this happening with other points of stigma, right? Of like, um, 
like gender transition, right? Like people in younger generations understand that much more than people in older generations because they've been exposed to it, right? It's been in our media, it's been in our classrooms. Um, so I think if we continue to talk about language, um, hopefully some of these things will organically, will start to shed them. Um, going back to uh, Tommy's question from before, we see this happening in other places, right? In other countries of the world, um, especially after like, large conflicts like World War II, right? Like when populations kind of got um, all sorted out, uh, resorted and migration happened, um, education followed and stigma reduced, right? So I really do think that just being more out there, um, and of course this is very self-serving because this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life, but I do, <laughs> I do think that it's really important um, and I also, you know, I encourage people, when people ask me like, what can we do? right? I encourage people to just call it out. I mean, it's very much like see something, say something of like somebody like, oh, I hate it when people say whatever, <laughs> or like blah, 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 and just be like, there is just normal, man. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's part of how language works. So yeah, I just, I try to just take the, take the volume down on all the stuff that really upsets us about how other people say things and just enjoy the variation, right? So it's my, it's my wish. <laughs> And I, and I think to follow up on Zoe's question, I think the, the more that we have people, a public awareness of this. So I think one of the articles that you had, had to read today was the article about Kelly that, that she gave a workshop um, at U of M. There was, a, there was an article written about her in, in the Daily, right? So the more that that gets in the public, into the public awareness, the more that it trickles down into other spheres of what we do, whether it be teaching linguistics in high school, um, in, in elementary schools, having more awareness of what linguistic variation is. Um, but definitely what the, the types of things that Kelly is doing is, 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 is a great first step. It's not just linguistics research in a vacuum, it's, it's, it's talking to the public, right? It, it's, this, it's this sort of public facing research and making people aware of, of what it is that, that we're doing and what are the social implications, right? And so um, this type of, of, of scholar that, that Kelly is transforming herself into is not the type of scholar that linguists were 15 years ago, right? We didn't, we didn't know, people didn't know what, what, the magic, what the magic language was to talk to the world about linguistics, right? It was just like, I'm just gonna sit here, we talk about my phonemes and my, my allophones and my syntactic trees and move on with my life and hopefully, hopefully nobody catches me doing something that's completely irrelevant to the rest of the world, right? Um, but now, you know, people like Kelly are realizing what, this, what, what, what you have to do, right? And so I think it's more people like, 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 like Kelly, right? Just talking about their research um, and offering public awareness, public scholars, right? So we talk about academic scholars, but we forget about what public scholars are and this is public research that is important, necessary. It's, a, it's a sort of redefining the role of what academics are. You are too kind. I feel like I, I also like to tell people just like use your voice, you know, like so many times like people like, oh, you're a woman, you're about to go have a job interview, like make sure you don't say like or um or anything like that. It's like, no, just speak, just speak how you speak. You know, I say that with full recognition that it can get you arrested or killed if you're like speaking Spanish and someone didn't expect you to be, but uh, you know, encouraging pride in your own voice and the, and the own amazing flexibility that we all have with our style shifting and stuff. So like, listen to yourselves a little bit as you sort of move through life and try and give people, you know, strength and confidence in their own voices. I'm, I don't know if this is like a question, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts on um, like uh, actors or comedians that are famous for doing impersonations of other people that like have voices that aren't their own. Oh my gosh, I have so many thoughts about that. <laughs> um, so <laughs> about eight months ago, I was thinking about writing my dissertation on stand-up comedy because of, for this exact reason. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. It's really interesting because a lot of people say that we don't have the knowledge base that a lot of linguists argue that we do, right? Like we're not really aware of regional dialects and things like that. But then you see comedians who travel in every city of the country doing stand up using accents like the Indian dad accent or the white mom accent or the black guy sounding like a white person accent, right? Um, that's, it's, comedy is like a 100% spoken endeavor. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's all about invoking other styles and, in, and embodying other speakers um, to like get your point across really interesting and really exciting work is being done there um, by a girl named Julia Cox. 
Um, so there's there's definitely a, a, so a building body of literature on that. Um, you really get very quickly, very deep into questions of like appropriation. <laughs> um, and those, those waters are murky. They are, they're, you know, it's, it's uncharted territory in linguistics at this time. Um, but it's very fascinating, um, especially because those jokes are funny because people know what it means, right? right? So it's not just that I know, oh, you're an Indian guy. It's that like, I expect you to behave a certain way and I can laugh at this because I've made assumptions about who you are based on how you sound. Um, so yeah, it's all over the place. It's really fascinating. Um, like watch that space because there's going to be <laughs> a lot more work, but yeah, no, I could talk about it for a day. <laughs> um, right. No. Thank you so much. It's 656. So yeah. I, I, I really appreciate this. This has been wonderful. Um, I have, I have three announcements for the, for the class and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, the first is that, so if you guys remember last Tuesday, which was the first day of class, we talked about the final project of this course, which would be sort of developing some kind of, of survey uh, through Amazon MTurk, where we would um, try to understand what, what were the social attributes um, that listeners sort of associate with different linguistic features of Andalusian Spanish. So you can imagine all of us working together on the type of survey that, Sally, that Kelly created for her, for her dissertation work here. So she's sending, sending sort of a really nice example for what we would like to do collaboratively as a class as sort of our final project, right? So that's, 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 that's the first thing. Um, second thing, uh, just a business. Uh, so in terms of, of, of us, uh, Spanish 47. So Bloque Uno on Tuesday, um, it is an open hour, right? You can use it to watch either of the two movies. Um, study for the quiz, um, ask me questions, I'll be on Zoom. You don't have to be on Zoom, uh, but then we'll all come back at 5.30 to take the quiz from 5.30 to 6.10, right? Um, th that'll be the quiz time. And then you would be able to hand in the quiz uh, via Canvas until 11.59 p.m. on uh, Tuesday evening. Um, and then we'll, we'll have the second half of, of Tuesday class to talk about the entrevistas with our Andalusian informants. Um, and then the last announcement is I'll have, I'll have um, office hours on Canvas, or I'll have them on Zoom. I'll send out a Zoom link Sunday at 8 p.m. for those of us who want to ask questions, review, review questions for the quiz, Sunday at 8 p.m. Um, and I think that is it. So um, maybe, can I love taking Zoom screenshots of my classes, and I know Kelly has been so great to be here. Maybe we can all just like wave while I take a screenshot of all of us or something like that, so we can all at least remember that we were doing this. Just keep waving. There you go. There you go. All right. Okay, great. And that way we have a memory that we actually did this. Okay. Thank you so much, Kelly. This was amazing. Uh, great research, um, amazing connection to our class, and wonderful questions by my students. I feel like we could be here for even longer asking questions, but we need to get on and do our thing. So th thank you so much. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for your interest and attention. I really love talking to you guys. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank 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 you.